If I asked you how the ECB's monetary policy decisions reach the economy, you might well say through banks. And you'd mostly be right. Banks are indeed one of the main channels through which our monetary policy is passed onto the economy. Plus, it's where many people like you and me feel the changes to monetary policy through the rates for loans and savings. Welcome to the ECB Podcast Summer School, helping you understand what's going on in the economy and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. Banks aren't doing all the work when it comes to what we call monetary policy transmission. Financial markets are key players, and some funds and insurers are also becoming more important as providers of loans and financial services. But here in the euro area, banks play a particularly important role. That's because our capital markets are less developed than in, say, the US, meaning that those looking for funding are much more likely to turn to banks to find it. Explaining today's topic for us is ECB Chief Economist and Professor Philip R. Lane. Good to see you again, Philip, for the last episode of our Summer School mini-series. It's, it's my pleasure to be here. Now, we want to zoom in on exactly how banks pass on our monetary policy decisions to you, to me, and to the rest of the economy and the important role that they play in helping us to get inflation back down to our target of 2%. So, Philip, how exactly does it work? How do banks pass on the changes to our key interest rates? So, so that's a, a, a many-layered uh, question. So let me tackle it in a couple of ways. Number one, um, I think uh, everyone listening understands that they, they do not have a direct relationship with the ECB. Uh, if you as an individual knock on our door, we're not going to open up a, a, a deposit account and we're not going to offer you a loan. So, as you say, uh, most firms and households in Europe primarily rely a, a, on their bank if they want to save or, or to, to, to borrow. You raise uh, deep questions about the, the role of the wider financial system whether it's insurance companies, pension funds, mutual funds, other type of market activity, which has grown in Europe, but remains relatively limited compared to the US. Okay, so, so let, let, let's take the case where a firm or an individual really has a, a mostly the, the option uh, if they want to, to save or to borrow to go to their bank. Mm. So then the big question is, how do banks determine what is the interest rate they're going to charge on a loan? And then equally, what is the interest rate they're going to offer on a deposit? And then let me trace that back to us at the ECB. So at the ECB, uh, when we raise interest rates, we are basically raising the rates at which uh, banks can deposit money with us or lend money from us. So the ECB is a central bank. Uh, and uh, it's called a central bank because our customers are banks. Our counterparties are our banks. So if we take the uh, deposit rate, the b- rate at which they can uh, uh, receive income on, on a deposit with us, uh, when we raise the deposit rate, um, if you like, uh, it, me- it means that it puts a floor uh, on, on uh, the rates more generally in the economy. Because a bank, uh, if you like, always has the choice. Well, if I cannot, cannot earn more uh, on a loan to, to a firm, I can always put money on deposit at the ECB. Mm. So it puts a floor on the rate uh, at which it will lend to, to, to a firm or a household. And that floor is very important. Now, you might say, why, why uh, can't they just charge me the exact same rate that they uh, receive from the ECB. I've always wondered that. Uh, and the, the basic answer is twofold. One is uh, it costs to run a bank. They need to add a kind of margin for running costs. So whether that's the technology to fund the apps we all use these days, whether it's the cost of running a, a branch network, mm-hmm. the cost of regulation, because we do uh, t- to fight uh, terrorism and money laundering, Banks also have to spend a lot of money on what's called know your customer. So all of the, the regulatory uh, elements uh, from that. Uh, so that there's a lot of administration there. 
So one element is, is there's a, going to be basically a, an administration cost uh, extra amount added on top. And then there's also going to be a, a risk factor because uh, it's not the case everyone pays back their bank loan. Uh, firms uh, sometimes fail. Uh, sometimes uh, individuals get into a, a problematic situation and don't pay back their mortgage. So, so uh, banks have to uh, add, a, you know, if you like a, a risk uh, margin mm -hmm. as well. So the, the rate facing you when you walk in, in, into a bank or you phone up or you do an online chat, uh, it's going to be a mix of the costs coming from us uh, in terms of, if you like, the, the, uh, the wholesale cost of finance and then all of the, these, uh, these margins. Let me emphasize also it is uh, in, in terms of the, uh, uh, the overall uh, cost to a bank of making a loan to you, uh, partly they can borrow from us, uh, and uh, but the, you know uh, uh, they also heavily rely on on uh, deposits from customers, uh, and then also f they, they have kind of various market type funding uh, that they may issue a bond uh, in the bond market, and so the overall cost of finance um, depends on on the rates they have to offer depositors. It depends on the bond market rate um, and these other uh, sources of funding. So, th so this is why uh, it, it's not straightforward uh, uh, to, to, to see the connection between the ECB rate and the rate offered on bank loans. But uh, this has been a long running topic. OK, so many of us have indeed seen banks pass on higher interest rates quickly when it came to making loans more expensive, but, but not so quickly for the interest we receive on our savings. So what have we seen? Have banks passed on our key interest rate changes this, this last year? So we know quite a bit about hi history. And what we see now is basically in line with historical evidence. What's happened? Uh, they've raised their, their lending rates quite a bit, um, you know, uh, quite sharply. And in terms of the rates they offer in deposits, let me uh, make a very sharp distinction between two types of deposits. One is, if you like, the what we call the overnight rate. So um, everyone has a, who has a bank account will have a current account. This is the rate at which the, the account at which you, you debit money on your debit card, or you add money from your paycheck, whatever. On those overnight accounts, uh, very, li very li li little interest is offered. But that's always true, because essentially, uh, th this is a, uh, people have these accounts not, not necessarily to save money, but just to, to run their life, all the transactions. Now, when interest rates were super low, uh, maybe people did use these overnight accounts just also to save because what else were they going to do? So what's happened now is essentially banks have raised uh, the deposit rate quite a bit in what's called uh, time deposits. If you agree to commit your money for a year, for six months, for two years, for five years, then the interest rate on those deposits, it didn't happen immediately, but over time, these have gone up and they're not too far away on average uh, to the ECB rate. So this is where you park your money essentially for a certain amount of time and you get a higher rate than if you're just leaving it in your savings account and have access to it all the time, essentially. Exactly. So, so this is, if you like, a return to some uh, normal pattern. Uh, if you go back to the 1990s when I was a student, um, you know, I do recall at that point, people would were to make the effort because they say, why, why would I leave money in my current account when I can get some interest in my, if you like, uh, uh, saving account. Mm. Um, and people have essentially over the last year have relearned this, at least those who have enough money where it makes a difference. So th this is where I think uh, it is happening. It's not happening to the same degree across all of the European countries because, cause, because clearly banks will, will uh, raise deposit rates more quickly if they face competitive pressure uh, and also if they're in an economy where there's a big demand f for loans so, so that they want to raise funding in order to provide credit. So in those European economies where there's less demand for loans, 
or where there's less competition, it's happened less. But the basic economics is it takes time, but eventually banks will raise their lending rate, which happened quite quickly, and will raise their deposit rates. But let me emphasize, mostly only on those uh, time deposits Mm -hmm. where the customer does not have, uh, if you like, instant access. You do have to uh, accept that that the uh, you cannot you can't uh, have it both ways. If you want instant access, you're not going to earn much, if any, interest. If you are know you have the 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 kind of uh, flexibility to to put some of your money away for for you know a, a year, two years, or whatever, then then you are starting to see uh, visible interest rates again. Let's zoom out to look at how banks affect the economy, in particular what we call the real economy. So this is the part that produces goods and services, so big manufacturers, but also the bakery around the corner or or my hairdresser. The real economy is crucial to the euro area's economic activity and growth. So how has the behaviour of banks during our interest rate hikes affected the real economy? What have we seen there? So again, uh, we're one year into this hiking cycle. Uh, what we've seen is essentially the the level of, of lending has really come down quite quickly. Uh, and that's a mix of two factors. One, with high interest rates, uh, firms and households are less interested in, in, in uh, taking a loan. So, so one way it operates is that uh, loan demand is lower. And the other way it operates is that uh, loan supply. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier on. It is uh, banks become more cautious if they see that essentially uh, risk has gone up. Because with high interest rates and with a slowing economy, the probability of a firm or household running into trouble, it, it doesn't you know, dramatically shoot up, but it, it nudges up. Mm. So, so they, they, they are going to be more careful saying, well, I don't want to make uh, too many loans because some of these loans may turn bad. Uh, so so we, see, we see all of that. OK, where does this matter? Uh, I think uh, one issue where we would uh, be tracking quite carefully is investment. So uh, firms may be tempted to say, well, you know, uh, this year I'm not going to invest for the future uh, because it's too expensive. And then over time, uh, if there's a lack of investment, it reduces the growth capability of the economy. So in the near term, uh, it means less demand for, for investment goods. So many firms in Europe are there to, to support investment. They're making uh, capital goods, they're, they're advising architects, you know, uh, project managers. There's many people who, whose job it is, is to support investment. So with less investment, uh, you're going to see it. I think we're seeing it also in uh, basic consumption is 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 uh, flat. Mm. Consumption is not growing, even though incomes are growing. So these are things like people buying fridges or uh, right, yeah. So, so I mean, I think in terms of hierarchy, it's less activity in the housing market, and then it has the knock-on effects. If there's fewer houses being sold, mm. uh, then then uh, fewer uh, people who are visiting furniture shops, uh, you know. Uh, uh, washing machines, all, all of that. So we do think that that's quite visible uh, r- right now. Let me emphasize, however, and this is so important to appreciate, it, is we do think uh, there's a very fundamental reason why this process is working, but in a relatively stable manner. Because uh, another byproduct of the pandemic was that people did have a period when they, they were consuming very little. So they did save more than normal. And these pandemic savings allowed them to reduce their debt, allowed them to maybe build up a nest egg, for example, uh, a mutual fund or something like that. Um, so it does mean if, if a hassle gets into trouble, they maybe have more buffers mm-hmm. um, and they don't necessarily get, get into a bad loan situation so quickly. Also for firms, I mean, for firms, it differs quite a bit across sectors, but many firms were were supported by their governments during the pandemic. And then more recently, many firms, as we talked about uh, in another episode, have been making money, have been making good profits. Mm. So so there's also, if you like, the the kind of uh, uh, what we think is this will help reduce demand, help cool inflation. 
but will not produce the kind of deep recession we had in Europe 15 years ago. Uh, and so this is, this is a, I think, very important distinction because people are very nervous when they hear uh, uh, kind of uh, phrases about uh, tightening, uh, kind of uh, depressing demand, dampening demand. Uh, and what we're trying to do is, is uh, uh, do enough that we do make sure inflation comes back to target, but we, we don't see the conditions right now because it, you, you usually need this kind of toxic mix um, where firms are already weak, customers are already weak. Uh, but, but you know, I think uh, many people are in OK shape. So they will respond to high interest rates by reducing demand. But we don't think it will lead into this kind of vortex uh, that leads to a deep recession. If we look specifically at economic activity, you just mentioned that we're not looking to, to have a recession here in Europe. The economy is, however, weak right now, and it, it is expected to recover, but only kind of over time. Do you see that as an issue? What does it mean if activity stagnates? I mean, not a recession, but it stagnates. Well, um, let's not overly focus on, on, on the issue, the technical issue of recession, because uh, I think we've always said for months now uh, that that you know whether the economy is a little bit above zero or a little bit below zero uh, is it, not the fundamental issue. What I thought about is what what's very damaging is a deep and sustained recession. So we we don't see that, and what we do see is compared to where we were last year, there's a lots of reasons to believe the European economy will will grow uh, over the next couple of years. One basically is it remains the case there's still a recovery from the pandemic. There's a bounce back. We're well below the level of the economy we might have expected if the pandemic had not happened. And if you like that, that kind of uh, trend line, uh, we would expect to reemerge over time. Uh, we would expect uh, energy prices being a lot lower now. Uh, that's not fully been uh, arrived in people's utility bills yet. But over time, lower energy bills will will help. Um, and uh, now we are seeing that uh, wages go up. So as wages go up, the kind of uh, very difficult situation at the end of last year when inflation was sky high and yet wages were, were had not gone up. Uh, over time, households should be in a better financial position. Mm. So there are a number of reasons to believe that uh, the European economy will grow uh, over the next couple of years. And the trick for us is basically to make sure demand does not outrun supply. So it's not a question of, of having uh, driving uh, demand deeply negative. It just has to grow more slowly than supply. OK, well, as you know, Philip, we, we always ask our guests to share a tip, maybe a book, a film, a story with our listeners on the topic that we've been talking about today. So banks, what would you have to share with our listeners today. So let me advertise a uh, work by, by some of our colleagues at the Bank of England. So I think there's a very nice book, which is, I think, uh, uh, should be of interest to, to, to many people. Uh, and the title of the book is called Can't We Just Print More Money? Economics in 10 Simple Questions by Rupal Patel and Jack Meaning. Uh, and this book, I think, uh, uh, is, is a, a fantastic uh, explainer of, of many of the concepts we've been talking about. I can only agree. It's a fantastic book, and I really recommend that everyone reads it as you do. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank ECB Chief Economist Philip R. Lane for taking us through the role banks have in passing on our monetary policy and for being our guest on these three summer school episodes. If you found them useful, please subscribe and leave us a review. And be sure to check out the show notes for more on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB Podcast Summer School with Katie Ranger. This is my last episode before I hand over the mic for a little while. So today I'm signing off with an especially big thanks for listening. <laughs>